Hello, everybody. It's a wonderful thing to see 200 people come into our virtual room. Looks like you must have come in single file. That was very quick, very orderly. <laughs> I wish we could see each other in person. But I think it's a good time to say thank you to you, Dr. Mangino, for opening up to us here on campus and helping us to make a connection with you. I think I can speak for all of my colleagues in saying that it's a generous and kind thing to do, so thank you. It's a good idea to remind everybody of some of the points in your biography. You are a sixth president here at Queensboro Community College. Just before coming here, you worked in the Bronx at Ostos Community College as vice president for academic affairs. You are an alumna of the Aspen Presidential Fellowship for Community College Excellence. It's a leadership program, and I hope I can remember to get us back to that later. You began at Ostos in 2004 as an assistant professor. And then from there, you became a coordinator, a department chair, an associate dean for academic affairs, and then interim provost. Early in your professional career, you were an elementary school teacher. Then you became an adjunct professor at St. John's University. And like uh, many of our students, and like our former interim president, Dr. Tim Lynch, you are a first generation college student. So welcome and thank you. Thank you, thank you so much for having me. And before we begin, I would like to ask that we take a moment of silence just to recognize all of those who have suffered from COVID and for the fact that we are adding Jacob Blake's name um, to those who have been, you know, lives have been impacted or lost to the systemic racism of our country. Thank you. And I just want to say that I am committed to um, equity and inclusion and have been throughout my career and look forward to you know, continuing that work here at QCC. I've been in communication with our Black Faculty Staff Association and working collaboratively to determine how we can implement the guidelines and the recommendations from our colleagues. I also truly support Dr. Lynch's um, recommendation to have a faculty fellow for diversity to help move this forward. And what I ask for us as a community is that we hold each other accountable for this work to make sure that we make real change at QCC. Thank you. It's meaningful to hear, important to hear. Well, I'm looking here at your face on our screen. I'm looking in my camera and imagining all our colleagues whom I miss so much. It's nice to connect them this way, it's not the same. We're living in a virtual world. And I, I expect many of us now are hoping that we can be able somehow to reach out, to connect with one another and to be there for one another, to help sustain us. Just talking to you now is a sustaining mm -hmm. thing for me. There's an important word that I've noticed that you use a lot, Chris, and it's student success. And I know that word is at the center of our QCC mission. Student success can mean many things. What does it mean to you? That students get to reach their goals, I, I believe very strongly that, you know, there's a lot of energy and effort it takes for students to get through our doors between, the, you know, they're paying for an application fee, they're completing an application, they're filling out very challenging documentation to get financial aid. They are, you know, up until this semester, they were taking placement exams. They're, you know, working, trying to get onto campus to figure out their immunization and, and to register for classes. So why do only, you know, six out of 10 students make it through just that first year? So, you know, I am committed to making sure that those students who they all had a goal of getting a college education when they went through that process, how do we make sure that they do reach those dreams and, you know, earn their degree, whether they decide to move on for a bachelor's degree or to go straight to work, but that they are making a difference, that that degree is making a difference in their lives. How about from a, a student's perspective? What would success look like to a student? I think that's the same thing, right? That they feel that they can do it, right? I think every student, you know, and I felt the same thing as a doctoral student the first day in my 
doctoral class, like, ooh, I'm not smart enough to be here, right? And somebody's going to notice that. How do we make students feel that they are smart enough to be here and they belong here and we're here for them to help them get to reach their dreams and their goals? What about from an educator's point of view? As an, as an educator myself, how do we, you know, spark their interest, their curiosity, their, how do they discover what they're passionate about, right? Like that's part of that education. And then, you know, how do we give them the skills so that, you know, whatever their, their career directory takes them, right? So we know that 30 years from now, our, our workplace is going to look so different from now. So many of the degrees, you know, and the knowledge that students get today is going to be much different in the future. So how do they apply that knowledge? And then how do they have the adaptability to change with society in their fields? That would be student success. At QCC, we have an Office of Institutional Effectiveness. So, so what, what does student success look like from the institution's point of view? So, I mean, across the country, right, we're all held accountable for our three-year graduation rates, our student retention rates, um, but it's so much more than that, right? So, you know, for students to get to graduation, they have to first complete the courses, right? So how do we help students be successful and make it through a course and then through a semester and then through the year? Um, you know, how do we make sure that there is no equity gap so that every single one of our students have the supports that they need specifically to help them make that happen? You know, rather than saying, you know, students didn't have the, the education in the K through 12 system, the question is, how do we help support them where they are so that they can make it to the end and walk across the stage of graduation? That's our mission. I suppose as we get to know you, it's, it's valuable to learn a little bit about your, your childhood. So are you from around here originally? I was born in Zyka Heights in Brooklyn near Bensonhurst. Um, and in the middle of elementary school in the years, I moved out to Merrick on Long Island and then stayed there for most of my time. Um, I have a brother who is a year younger than I am, and I grew up with both my parents. My dad had stopped out of school in the ninth grade. Um, he had attended Catholic school and was not a good experience. My mother graduated from high school but had never gone further on. But as despite the fact that they didn't have an education, I didn't realize how abnormal it was that at dinner every night, we always had dinner together, but after we ate, we would sit around the table and play these games and just have these competitions to figure out like who can name all of the capitals of all the states, who can name all the states in alphabetical order. And then as I got older about, you know, crossword puzzles and cryptic quotes and, you know, we would spend hours like, you know, looking it up in things in the atlas or encyclopedias and stuff. And so they, they truly gave gave me that foundation of curiosity. You know, you mentioned your, your dad's experience with education. What about you? you? You chose to go to Nassau Community College. What led to that and, and what was it like there for you? Yeah, so I, ironically, right? So even though I had that at family dinner, I didn't see the value of education in high school. It was more about how do you get away with passing and not going to class. So I didn't even think about college until I saw that, you know, people around me, you know, friends were starting to apply. And I'm like, oh, I think this is something I'm supposed to do. And not knowing any better, I, you know, I'm like, oh, NYU, that sounds amazing. So I applied to NYU. And thankfully, at the same time, I applied to NASA Community College. And NYU said, thanks, but try us again in a couple of years. And NASA Community College, you know, the first semester, I realized, oh, my gosh, like, I love to learn. And I'm actually good at this, you know, and I, I graduated with a 4.0 having, you know, just it didn't I didn't even realize how much that mattered until I started working at a college. I'm like, oh, wow, <laughs> that was good. So they really gave me the foundation. Um, and then one day, you know, sitting in a class again, I didn't know what I wanted to major in. So, you know, I saw the list in the application, I'm like, oh, hotel restaurant management. That sounds interesting. And I circled it. But within a semester, I realized, you know what, I was looking at a faculty member in a classroom, I'm like, that's what I want to do with my life. 
you know? And so I didn't know, go talk to an advisor because you don't want to graduate with an AAS degree in hotel restaurant management and then transfer, right? I, I should have done that. But when I transferred to Hofstra, you know, like many of our students, most of my credits did not transfer. They accepted them all, right? I graduated with 156 credits with a bachelor's degree, but they didn't all count for anything. Um, you know, so I realized how important it is to help students make those connections and students to realize how important it is to reach out to us and ask questions along the way. You talked about being inspired by the, what you saw in the classroom, the, mm -hmm. the way the faculty member was acting as a teacher inspired mm -hmm. you to know that you wanted to yep. do that. But it's a reminder to me that we model many things for our Absolutely. students, only a professional goal. Is there any teacher in your life that has an indelible imprint on who you are as a teacher? <laughs> I think there's a couple, right? So back in elementary school, I had an art teacher who, as a, just as a person, she had, you know, taken me under her wing and she had heard that I had just been diagnosed with scoliosis. And she says, you know, her daughters also had it. And she had me, you know, reach out to my mom to start attending these, you know, support groups with her and her kids, which I thought was great. Um, and then in my master's degree, I had a faculty member who, my first time, you know, when I was just about to get into a classroom to cover for somebody, you know, as my first full-time job, she had me to her house and her and her husband, who's also a faculty member at Hofstra, helped me figure out my lesson plans for the week. But I think the one who was the most impactful was my do in my doctoral program. I had, you know, again, I say you know, that first day, that first class where I felt like, ooh, you know, talking about imposter syndrome, right? That I, they were going to find out I don't belong here. She actually reached out to me at, during that week after that first day of class to say that I impressed her and would I do research um, fellowship with her. And I had the opportunity to do that for three years. And she was known across the world um, in the done and done learning style model. And so I got to work with her and work with individuals from around the world to help them get certified as official trainers in her program. And it was such a, an intense process for them to go through that. So I really became friends with so many people where I've actually gone to their countries to get to visit them. Um, but she gave me lots of opportunities to see what the potential was. And I think, you know, the biggest thing was when I was applying to Ostos, I was also applying to a, um, a private school at a master's level program. And I was leaning towards Ostos just because the people were so much nicer. But she said to me, you know, go to CUNY because you have room to grow there. And, you know, I think I thought about that as I was, you know, appointed as president. I, I wish she was still alive so that she could see that, you know, yes, she saw the potential in me that I didn't necessarily see at the time. Oh. I was going to ask if you were still in touch with her. Yeah. You, you mentioned the done and done learning program. Mm -hmm. I'm yep, there was reader done. Mm -hmm. Sounds interesting. Yeah. There might be a mentor in your life who was very influential in developing who you are as a leader. Is there somebody like that that you want to tell us about? So she was part of that, but also I think, you know, I'm very reflective in my teaching practice to always figure out how do I be the best teacher. And I think I do that with leaders. So in every supervisor that I've had, watching to see what can I learn from that, whether of don't do that, right? Or, you know, this is, this is really effective and builds the right environment that you're looking for. So, you know, negatively, I'm gonna ignore, the, I'm not gonna use names, but there are people I'm like, ooh, you know, that really is not what you wanna do. But I think, you know, I had the privilege of working under, um, you know, our, our chancellor for five years, he was our president and I worked really closely with him. So seeing how, you know, he really inspired people um, and made everybody feel like their work was very important to the mission. And then my previous president, uh, Dr. David Gomez, I, you know, he had 40 years experience at CUNY, right? So it was a really great learning experience for me. And he had taken me under his wing to be a thought partner with him and all the change that we did at Ostos. And, and getting to watch that was very helpful. Is there one learning experience or one lesson you learned early on that sticks with you as an administrator or as, an, as a leader? 
the sense of community, right? And making everybody feel that they're important. You know, and I always said that as a, a teacher, as I was teaching our early childhood students at Ostos, I would tell them like, you know, we all gravitate to different people and personalities and right. So you always have your favorite. I said, but nobody in the classroom should ever know who their favorite is. And I feel that same thing as a, a as a leader. Nobody should know who, you know, on campus that you like more than everybody else, right? Like everybody should be treated equally. I'm thinking about what you said about student success. I, I, I think there's a saying about success meets, no, opportunity plus preparation equals success. If you can, take us, take us through the steps from the very beginning that have brought you to where you are right now. <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, at Ostos, within a year, you know, so my chairperson said to me again, within that first year, he's like, you know what, you're going to make a great president. And I'm like, I don't want to be a president. I absolutely love teaching. I don't want to get out of the classroom. Um, but they needed a coordinator within a year of my being there. And they had asked me to take it on. And you got to see like, ooh, you know, you could really help make change happen at a different level. You know, it was the same thing, like when you go from teaching elementary school, you have the impact on 30 students and I didn't want to lose that but then you realize as a faculty member at a college I have the impact on 30 students you're going to go out in the world and impact 30 students every year so then the same thing as a coordinator now I have an impact of changing a program to affect every faculty member with every student and so, you know, then they needed a chairperson and I, you know, was happy to do it because again, I was really curious about what's happening at the college level and how do I connect all of this and how do I help support my department? And, and I thought, all right, I'm, I'm going to stay as chair, but then you do that for a few years. And you're like, you know what, if I'm a dean, I can now really, you know, do that. So it was each step of the way that I was able to see how to make change happen. And, and I had lots of wonderful opportunities along the way. Again, within a few years of my being at the college, CUNY had created a teacher academy, and our provost at the time was insistent that it was only for the bachelor's programs, and she insisted with CUNY, like, no, it has to happen at the community college level. So I got to direct our teacher academy, which then gave me the ability to be at lots of meetings at CUNY Central to meet people across the campus and see how CUNY works and, and learn things that you would never have seen if you weren't all of a sudden now responsible solely for recruiting and, and all of the other parts of that program and then I think you know this past year or two years ago now it's been um, I you know President Gomez at Hostos had been part of he was a mentor for the for Aspen and he's like look he's like you need to apply he's like I see you know you have the talent to do this and so I applied and for a year we I had the privilege of you know meeting community college presidents from across the country who you know are making change happen right and improving student success and really just transformational and just the learning I you know we read so many wonderful articles that I realized, oh, wait, we need to do this at Ostos. And I put together a group where we started reading these articles together to see how do we impact Ostos and make change. And then, you know, it, the community that we that created, you know, you talk about community, the, the, I'm still in touch with the 40 people in my cohort so that, you know, as we hit COVID, we're all, you know, texting each other, what are you guys doing for this? What are you doing for that? And Aspen was wonderful enough to create webinars through that whole crisis of, you know, let's talk about enrollment, let's talk about the technology, let's talk about this. And you got to bounce ideas off of people across the country absolutely an amazing opportunity and a growth experience for me that sounds wonderful that it continued yeah it didn't just uh -huh. help you because yeah you had the yeah there. That, uh -huh. oh. what you said about making change happen is 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 moving for me to hear and i know i've talked to a number of my colleagues who have said that this is seems like a, a, a moment that is for our college where we can institute change it's a good time to thank our interim president, Dr. Yes. Timothy Lynch, because he said, I want to keep the ship afloat, keep us healthy, get us through middle states, uh, but I want to defer to my successor to make the change happen. So we're ready, and, and thank you for talking to us about that. Yeah, absolutely.
Um, early in my time getting to know you, I saw in your materials that you had been a childhood educator, and I, I, I was very moved by that because helping a young mind to develop, I think, is, is a precious thing. How about the, the differences or the similarities between teaching a young child and teaching a college student? Both are the same. How is that different? And, and why? I think my first year as a teacher, I joked that they're just taller. Right? It's the same process, but now I know what the difference is. It's about our students have so much more life challenges that they are juggling and trying to prioritize their education. It's not an easy part of that. Where in an elementary school, you know, life still is affecting them absolutely, but they're not the ones solely responsible for getting through that, right? Where our students really do need to, you know, it's hard to prioritize your education when you're trying to feed your family and take care of children and parents and, you know, that finding out where a place to sleep for the night, right? So I think that's the difference, especially for, you know, the CUNY's population, right, in general. If you were on campus now and you saw a faculty member walk by and you could say one thing, what, what would you say? <laughs> One thing's hard, right? I think it's that, you know, to recognize what we've all been through, right? And the faculty have been through since March, right? It's, it's, there's been a lot thrown at us, you know, between COVID and the economy and, and the, the racial, you know, injustice that's happening and the, the civil riots that are occurring. And at the same time, having to be the pillar of strength for all of our students and be there for them, I think is a real challenge. And I think that needs to be recognized. And I think, you know, we haven't had a chance to, you know, take a breath from that yet. And we're back into a new semester. And I, you know, I want them to understand that I, I get that, right? And I appreciate the fact that, you know, you're all here today for our students on the first day of class, even though we're all juggling a lot of emotions. Faculty governance leaders, and um, my role as a faculty governance leader is to represent the Senate. We've been working throughout the summer to develop a reopening plan when the time comes to to phase into using our campus again. And I remember when we were meeting with you one time, you said that, that self-care was important. Yeah. And I, I, I was sustained by that. Yeah. Sometimes you go to a meeting and you think, I can't do this. I, I... Yeah. Anyway. No, I, I, yeah, because if ahead, we're I, not I, in the right place, we can't help them, right? So how do we have to recognize and take time for ourselves so that we can keep going? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And I think it's sort of a mirroring thing. I know that it worked for me, at least, in the classroom this, this, mm -hmm. during this time to spend a significant time saying, let's start with you, Ramon. How are you today? Yeah. What's the victory that you felt? What's the biggest challenge you've had? And yeah. then it, it helps me to feel stronger to know that I'm hearing them. I saw that you're starting a book club. Mm -hmm. You're a, you're, a, you're a big reader, I'm thinking. Absolutely. Is there a book now that you're reading that you're learning a great deal from that you want to tell us about? So, I mean, I just finished two of the books that are part of the book club, right? And now my daughter had recommended How Remarkable Women Lead. So I am reading that. And then um, based on a conversation that I just had with a faculty this week um, about a book that QCC faculty created, which was um, humanistic pedagogy across the disciplines. So I ordered that the day I got off the call with that person. Um, so, you know, the problem is I used to read um, my Kindle would be on audio going back and forth to Ostos, right? So I would get three hours that way. And then I'd be at the gym reading while I'm on the treadmill and I get to read that way. So I have to figure out how to fit it all in now that I, you know, there's no commute and there's no gym. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's good that you mentioned that volume. I, I want to give a shout out to my college, my colleague, Dr. Amy Traver, one of the mm -hmm. editors of that book. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity to uh, show how we apply different learning styles, et cetera, to, to the important concepts of the Holocaust and genocide and the work that our Kupferberg Holocaust Center does here on campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I'm learning a little bit about a program that you're starting this fall that Queensboro is starting with, with high school students from the Queens area. 
in which they testify to their truths and their experiences about racism. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so it's in um, collaboration with SNEPS Media and a foundation um, to reach out to middle school and high school students for them to give voice to the racism that they've experienced. Um, and they can do this through a paragraph, through a poem, through you know any kind of media that they feel best demonstrates their, their feelings and their experience, but also to include part of that as their leadership, right? So how do they see we can change racism and end racism in the country? So once we have the collection, we're going to have QC students um, be the judges because there are monetary awards through this foundation in order to give to the students. So I thought it was a great way for our students to also empower them to be able to be part of this project. What you said reminds me of something else I learned about in your, your partnerships with uh, organizations around the community to yeah. help us with support for this kind of thing. You know, there's a reason why we're a community college, right? We're supposed to be supporting the community that we were situated in, right? And figure out how do we have partnerships to help support each other in the work that we do. Absolutely. I'm thinking about a, a lot of our students who may be watching now who see in you someone who looks like them in that you're the first in your family, in your generation to go to college. I suppose that makes you think about the entities that we have on campus that help students. What, what do you have to say about our student services here at school? They're all there, right? I think, you know, what I've found from everybody that I've met, right, faculty, staff, students is, you know, everybody is doing their best to help support students. And there's lots of programs. I think the challenge is how do we connect students to the programs and how do we connect the students that aren't reaching out on their own, right? How do we connect the people that were like me and just, you know, I would go to school and just do what I think I'm supposed to be doing by reading, you know, the, the website or a catalog or something. But how do we let them know reach out, ask us a question, check with an advisor, you know, the food pantry, the fact that it's open and has been open, how do we get that word out? Um, you know, I know there was a research project at OSTOS where we found that the majority of our students had no idea we had mental health counseling, right? And I know, you know, at QCC, we had, you know, again, a very strong program. How do we make sure that students know? And that how do we make sure that they grab our hands when we reach out to them? That reminds me of a shout out I want to give to an email that I think we all got. Uh, are you ready? The Are You Ready mm -hmm. program. Mm -hmm. It's an online program yep. where the students can, yep. I suppose at any time in the semester, they could make sure that they know what they need to know. Yep. As a faculty member, I can say it's a challenge to be conversant with every single program that we have here. Sometimes it's like an alphabet soup of all the different uh, initials that we use to describe what we offer to our students but i guess it's a good problem to have and it's only a click away you can click online to see on our, on our website what we offer yeah no and how do you help students understand what that alphabet soup is right or what our lingo in higher ed is you know like you, yeah. we, we've made you know first soaring a verb right like what does that even mean you know <laughs> why do we use that those terms for students it just adds another layer of challenges for them I love that you said that. I've been trying to use the term student hours instead yeah. of office hours. I yes. forget who the word was. Someone said, the student may not know what that is. No, there, it was an article last year in one of the Inside a Higher Ed of the Chronicle. I read both of those every morning. That's another part of my reading ritual. But to let, it was about how students didn't even know what office hours were. So I had sent it out to all the faculty. Like, how do we reword that so that students get it, right? As a faculty member, I used to meet the students in the cafeteria. I would do my office hours in the cafeteria because it was less intimidating to come see me, right? You could just walk by and see if I'm there, right? And then come in rather than having to go to an office where, you know, you might not feel as comfortable. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I remember talking to you early on that you mentioned that you like as an administrator to be a presence on campus. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You may know on our campus, our new science atrium. Yes. So imagine it's the end of the semester. It's not too cold. You're in the <laughs> science atrium and you see a student who after their first semester is struggling. What do you say? <sighs> to figure out why, 
right? So like to really look deep into what are you doing, right? So for instance, if a student doesn't do well on exam, right? And even my own kids, right? I would always be like, well, go back and read the question that you got wrong and think about like, why do you think you got it wrong? Was it because you didn't understand the question or because you didn't know the information enough, right? So do you have to either do more time studying or figure out the question, right? So my own daughter one time when she read it, She's like, well, I figured I didn't understand what the question meant. So I figured I had to pick, it was multiple choice. I had to pick the word that I had no idea what it was because that would only make sense. And I was like, well, not so much, right? But, but really understanding like how a teacher words a question or how and so many of us use the test banks, right? And the wording is usually a little tricky, right? So helping students understand that. So for a student who's struggling, is it because you're not putting the time and energy in? Is it because it's not something that you're passionate about, right? Because then you want to find a field and a discipline where you are passionate. Um, but there's, you know, there's self-reflection and helping them do that to figure out what needs to be put in place for them to be successful? Is it just that they don't go to tutoring, right? And, you know, students feel like, well, I'm not supposed to go to, like, only people who are struggling, right, should be going to tutoring. Well, no, you know, even our A students, if you go to tutoring, you're going to do better, right, in your classes. So, you know, helping them with that. You know, it, you say that, it reminds me of a good resource for students that I, was able to put on my syllabus because I saw there's a, you get on our college website and scroll down a little bit and there would be support for students. You click there, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. virtual tutoring, yeah. Tiger Night. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a good thing to learn. Yeah, no, and at the end of COVID, right, when we're all back on campus, is that a resource that we still keep partially virtual for students, right, so that students can access it and they don't have to, you know, commute to campus just to go to tutoring, right? Is there a way to support them while they're doing the work, right? So if a student's doing their homework and struggling, are they going to stop and get on a bus to come here? Or would they be more willing to click on, you know, Zoom and work with a tutor that way? I think, you know, that's, there's going to be benefits at the end of this of where we realize, you know what, we can do this better, um, you know, to help support students. And that goes back to equity, right? You know, do students have the money, right? If their choice is to, you know, feed their family or get on a bus, we're all gonna choose to feed our family. But if they could still connect to us virtually, that's a good option. That's, that's, a, that's a hopeful thing to hear about that, that we're all done with this. Yeah. And the best of both worlds. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think we have totally learned that there are ways to be, do better in the work that we do. Say you had a recent college graduate that you were talking about, someone who just graduated from Queensbury. You have any advice for that person? Mm -hmm. Make sure that you're doing work that you're passionate about, right? I think that's, I think we could all be successful if we find what that is. And it might not be that first job, right? And that first job is a stepping stone for the, you know, to the next job. And what do you learn in that job to take with you, you know, like every moment for all of us, right, is a growing experience, right? And so what can you do from, take from that? And to continue to stay connected to the college, right? Just because you're a graduate doesn't mean that, you know, you're still not one of ours, right? And how do we help support them through that, right? If they're transferring and having issues transferring, if they are working at a job and they want to now look for another job, reach out and let us help you, right? And then to stay connected to our alumni. Right, yeah. Huh. yeah. We've come to a time where I can put on my Alex Trebek hat and take you through a speed round of questions and see within 15 seconds. <laughs> and there's going to be a timer and there's a Pontiac in it. Used, but a Pontiac that you win. All right, are you ready? Are you ready for this? I'm ready. First job. I was a maid cleaning hotel room or motel rooms. Um, and then I also was an aerobics instructor for Elaine Powers. What did you learn in your first job? 
At Elaine Powers, I realized that when you got to teach everyone how to use the equipment, that I realized like, ooh, right? It was teaching, right? I, and I'm like, I am enjoying being able to explain to people information. And that so that connected with the faculty at NASA Community College is what drove me to education. Yeah, and then, you know, two other things. At the same time, I was also a crisis hotline um, counselor. So I was trained as a volunteer for um, Middle Earth Hotline, and that's now called Long Island uh, Suicide Hotline. And those skills have helped me throughout life, right? Of really how to help people feel that they're being listened to and heard, um, and how to, and how to stay calm during a crisis, right? Like that, you know. And then if I could take another second before I might lose the Pontiac, right? But, you know, I also had been a, <laughs> been a um, living counselor in it for a foster home for teenage boys. So I lived for a year with six boys from the ages of 12 to 16 and really, you know, helping to support them, but just seeing, you know, the supports that they need, um, the troubles that, you know, so many of our youth experience. Um, mm -hmm. It's definitely heartbreaking. Don't worry about the timing. Second prize is a ceramic tiger. All right. <laughs> you remember that on Wheel of Fortune, the early days when you'd go shopping when you won? Yes, and yes, yes. yes. Ridiculous yeah, yeah. I'll put it on account. I'll get the ceramic tiger. I thought, yeah. who would buy that? Anyway. Like in the price, what, in the like, heat of a moment, you do some things that you might not normally do. <laughs> 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 oh listen when, when you're not at work what do you like doing i love to run i picked it up seven years ago and i'm an avid runner i run, try to run five to six days a week um i love to hike when i can find people to go hiking with me um and obviously reading and i love to travel um the week before break you know we were shut down i was in iceland and you know geothermal spas that was just wonderful there's a show on netflix with zach efron which you may be familiar with where he and a friend go around to different parts of the world that have really sustainable ways of finding energy and iceland was one of them yeah, yeah. Did you okay. see yes or no did you see zach efron i'm sorry i didn't hear what you said did you see zach efron when you i did iceland? not know <laughs> all right you, you mentioned running is there a long race that you ever did I like to run on my own because that's how I clear my head. Two races that I did, one was for a fundraiser for Bronx Community College. So we did a 10K around the Bronx. Um, you don't realize how hilly it is until you're running it. Um, <laughs> and then one New Year's Eve, my son and I did the run at midnight around Central Park in Central Park, which is amazing. If nobody's ever done it, you could walk it, but the fireworks and it's just an amazing experience. Oh, that does yeah. sound... But those were the only two races. The rest of it is really just is therapeutic. <laughs> you, you, you mentioned what it's like to clear your mind by mm -hmm. doing something, the, the repetition, the, the, the goodness, goodness. That's something so important to remember now. Whatever we can do. Yep. <sighs> yep. Yep. I love to go out in the morning at like 6 a.m. when nobody else is up. It's me and, you know, the rabbits and the squirrels and stuff and just, Yeah. Uh. You, how do you like our track on campus? I've seen it. I have not run it yet, but no, it's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. But our campus is something to be, to be great. I, yes. Places to, to unwind. Yeah. You, you, I think you said something about hiking. Is there a favorite place you like to hike? The Moab Desert was stunning. Um, I had so, the Moab Desert. Yeah. I was so hoping to go see Zion this year. Um, obviously, that's going to have to wait, but that was, I want to go back to Utah. It really impressed me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Have you ever been to Glacier National Park? Mm -mm. No. Nope. Oh, my goodness. It's so beautiful. It's, it's, uh, I used to spend my summers in Idaho and just north, within two or three hours drive, I think you have to go into Montana a little bit too, but there, the, the Glacier National Park is there and there's part where plate tectonics or whatever it is, the land has shot up. So right there you can see millions and millions of years into the past. It's absolutely That strange. was Iceland, right? We were standing in the middle of the two walls that was just 
Yeah. Right. Breath yes. tape. Yes, I mm -hmm. saw that on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, Iceland, I suppose, is going to be one of the places that you say is one of your favorite trips. Do you have another one? Um, so China was another one. I got to go for work. They reached out to me. Um, I got to go to Shanghai and Beijing. I was there for only three days. Um, so I would love to go back. Um, but I was able to work with, and again, I'm going for 15 seconds. I was able to work with the principals of all of the high schools in Beijing and Shanghai to, they were looking to use learning styles, right? And to teach to individuals learning styles. It didn't go anywhere after that. Politics changed and a new group came into play, but it was an interesting way to see the country from inside working with their officials. Um, but I did get to go stand on the Great Wall of China, which again, you know, surreal experience. Mm. I'm glad you mentioned the 15 seconds. It makes me think that sometimes we have a plan and something happens and it's better to do a new plan. I remember early in my oh, teaching time, I didn't know that and I would, oh. Yep, it's one of the top lessons, right, in teaching, right? If the right. Oh, class isn't with you, you need to stop and wait to make sure that they catch up. <laughs> yes. Yeah, which I think goes back to another leadership thing that I've learned, right? And that really stuck with me, right? You could have a plan, right? And you have, and you could get to the end line, but you might be there by yourself, right? So making sure that everybody understands and is on board with it um, is really important, right? And that was something that I found, you know, one time, again, one of those aha moments sitting in a committee, with, I wasn't even at the meeting, but I heard about it and then I went to see how do we help this, where some people came out of the, the meeting and thought, ooh, everything was great, this was the best meeting ever, and others were like, oh no, that was terrible. I'm like, how could it be so different, right? But then when I got there and you realize that, if you don't all have the same idea of what should be at the end of that meeting, the purpose of the meeting, right, and what you're hoping to get, then it's not helpful, right? So taking the time to see, okay, what are our beliefs, right? What do we all commonly agree on and where do we want to go together is really time well spent to make good work happen. Mm -hmm. I feel lucky because in our department, I, I teach in the music department, we spend a lot of time, our faculty, informally around our office space, talking about the ways we can reach our students best. And our chair now, Dr. Bjorn Burkow, and, and I are, are good friends. Mm -hmm. And he and I have talked a lot about, shall we lessen the content in our class ever so slightly so that the content we do deliver is really digestible? Yeah, no, I think that's something that faculty, you know, struggle with, right? Like you have the ideal of, well, this is what they need to know. But then there's the reality of what do they really know, right? And we all know that, right? Because when they take the second level class, everybody's like, what happened? It was taught there. But if it doesn't, they don't have the time, and it takes time, right, to retain the information, then it's useless if we've just covered it right and gone through it how do we make sure that it sticks with them and sometimes it's a matter of figuring out what's the most vital right because you know no matter how much we believe that after 60 credits they remember every single fact that we've taught them when they graduate we know the reality right is it it's a, it, it can't possibly all stick with you right so how do the concepts stick enough that you could apply the information so that they're successful Minus the, right, I want my nursing students to know everything. Because <laughs> that's my, right, like that. But, but there's the reality, right? If nobody's retaining anything in an hour and 15 minutes if it's all just. Yeah, that. yeah. I remember a professor, one that stuck with me, was talking about if we, at, I went to Lewis and Clark College for my undergraduate in Portland, and she said, if we teach you how to be interested in this subject and yep. curious so you can learn on your own, we're going to yep. feel successful. Yeah. Yeah, well, I taught a special ed class once where the final exam, instead of it memorized, right, it was that go figure it out. If you have a student with this disability in your class, what are the strategies you, go, you need to know, right? Because I felt like, you know, it could be five or 10 years before they have a student with a very specific, you know, a blind student or a deaf student in their class. So what I needed them to know is that they knew how to look up the information and create lesson plans using that to be effective, not memorize it. 
what we're talking about now is, is, is timely because it's worth giving a shout out to uh, Dr. Arthur Corradetti, who is our Dean for Institutional Effectiveness. I know our college is, 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 is deeply committed to assessing what we do on every level. I know my colleagues in the steering committee, Dr. Jeanette Ursioli and Dr. Ziva Perel-Katz, we work on assessing. How does the Senate work? How do our committees work? What can we do to be better? You do something, you look at whether it worked or not, and you make your plan to make it better the next time. Whew, that's, a, that's, a, that's a lot of work, but it, it gives you the motivation to want to just not check the boxes every semester. Whew. You mentioned your, you, I think you mentioned two children, a son and a daughter. I do. So my son is 21 and is leaving on Saturday to go back up for his last year at Buffalo. Um, and my daughter had spent a year at Albany and then transferred to Stony Brook. Hated college so much that she graduated in three years because she just wanted to be done with it. So she took every summer and winter class. Um, not the ideal, but she is now working at a bank um, and absolutely loving it and enjoying life. She's 23. Yeah. Oh. But, you know, what's been interesting is like, you know, being in the head of 18, 19 and 20 year old, 20 year olds as they're going through college. Right. So you see their thought process. You know, so my daughter, you know, when she had to take the placement exam, when she transferred from Albany to Stony Brook and she's trying and she's like, I can't figure it out. It was at home. They were having them do it through Alex software. And she's like, you know, I'm just going to say I can't do it. And I'm going to retake that remedial class. And I'm like, in what world would you do that? Right. And then I go and I read it and it's like, oh no, look, you just click this button. And I took pre-calculus at, at the college level in high school and now you're done. But she would have gone you know, so I always think about like, what would our students do if they don't have a mom who was a provost, right, guiding them through the process, you know, how many of them would have clicked that button and taken a remedial class that they didn't need, right? Or, you know, my son, you know, so many times he would call me from Buffalo, right, of I, my teacher now has us doing this homework assignment and we have to use Excel and I don't know how to use Excel and what do I do? And I'm like, well, go to the library because the librarians know everything about the campus, right? And say, you know, is there a workshop on Excel, right? And then he did that. And then, you know, one day he got me though because he called and he couldn't find the classroom. And I'm like, Nick, I really don't know. I said, go find a door that's open and ask somebody where the classroom is, right? But how do we make sure that every one of the QCC students have that that safety net, right? Who is it that they're going to call on campus when they're stuck? Uh, you mentioned campus. Is there a favorite part of our campus? Something that you really think is really nice about QCC? What do I think is really nice about QCC? I think is that the, the yeah, people- On campus. Anything. Oh, on campus? It's just so beautiful, right? I mean, I'm looking out my office windows, right? With the trees and, and stuff. Um, you know, the Holocaust Center was, out. I got the privilege to be able to go through that. I got to go through the art center, the art gallery. Um, it's, it's a beautiful campus and it has, you know, this whole sense of community, right? That there are, it's a closed in community. Yeah, yeah, it's a blessing for us that we have that campus. Mm -hmm. I, I see you're in your office. Yes. That gives some, some comfort to, to know you're there and you're know, holding, holding down the fort. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm mostly working remotely as everybody else is, but I think, you know, it was appropriate to be here today on the first day of class. How was traffic? Yeah, 15 minutes in the middle of rush hour. I got in my car at 10 to 9. I was here at 9.04, I think it was. Oh man, you can't beat that. God, I see my clock, it says about 125. We're coming a little bit to the end of our time. We spoke together for nearly an hour and the time went by. I so absolutely long. enjoyed it, Stephen. Thank you. Well, it's good, so good to get to know you. I, I want to thank the, the Vice President for marketing, Stephen DiDio, to, to do behind the scenes this very important work to make this technological thing happen, which is not easy that you and he and everyone at QCC had the idea, you especially, the idea to meet with us, so kind. You met with faculty governance leaders early on and you, you took the time to reach out to us and to ask us what our priorities were 
for QCC. What, what about you? What's your vision? I go back to, I mean, so let me start by saying I got to meet so many amazing people, right? I, I'm trying to meet with each of the chairs individually. I've met with numbers of, you know, governance students, um, local politicians. I mean, it's the only way I'm going to get to really know everybody, right, and find out what's really happening. So I am asking everybody their priorities. Um, you know, one of the things I ask is, you know, it's something that, you think should not change at the campus, right? And everybody's like, not, nothing should change. Like everything should be. There's so much great work happening and legitimate work, right? Like I read so much before I came here about the high impact practices, but everybody mentions it, right? So you know that it's really happening. So with that said, right, my vision is about how do we just, you know, do so much better for all of our students. So, you know, we have high graduation rates, we have high success rates, but that doesn't mean that every student is graduating, right? And every student's not seeing that success. So, you know, just like every other college across the country, there's equity gaps here, right? There, there's not every student, whether, you know, based on gender, ethnicity, if they're a veteran student, if they're a first generation student, there are gaps there. How do we make sure that we get rid of the gaps, right? How do we make sure that our practices and policies are equitable and inclusive across the college? And I believe, you know, if QCC you know, really highlights, right, we were just recognized again as being the most diverse community college in the country. I think with that comes the responsibility to make sure that every one of our students has the same opportunities and support systems that they need to graduate and walk across, you know, the stage at graduation. And that's my goal, you know, just building on the work that's already happening here and the dedication of everybody. Again, every person that I've met is really committed to helping support students and doing their best work. So together, we could really make this happen and become a national model, right, of how to do this work. Well, what you say reminds me, I'm starting my 11th year here, and when I first started, I thought, oh, what have I done? This is a crazy thing. But then I, I bonded with the college, and I, and, I, and I would want to say that to any of my colleagues who are watching who are earlier in their time here, you, you can become like a member of a family. We always like to urge people to participate in, in, in faculty governance. Our Senate is always ready to accept people who would want to run to fill a seat or, or, or work on a committee that helps to run our college. And, and what you're talking about, the, the, the vision of what, what we want to, where we want to be in five or 10 years helps to make me want to go to work. And it made me think about something else. I was um, preparing for class today and a student emailed me and asked me a question. I thought, wait a minute, I. I don't distract me. I need to be getting ready for my class. And then some little voice in my head said, Stephen, that's your job. Maybe more than preparing for your class. To reach out and say, here's what you do. Yeah. <sighs> well, I feel more motivated. And I think many people who are watching now, I, I believe, feel motivated to, 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 to march through this year with our heads held high and then to, to take care of our students the way that we, that we need to. And it will be May 30th in about five minutes. We'll see each other at commencement, God willing. Yeah, hopefully not. Yeah, and I just want to also recognize the anxiety that the campus feels with transition, right? Having a new president come in is always, ooh, you know, the personality, that the, the, what their vision is, what changes are they going to make, what, how are they going to disrupt our lives, right? And, and I just want to reassure people that, you know, the work here is amazing, right? The people are, are fabulous, that it really is about how do we just keep doing it together and just, you know, maybe change our, the frame or the lens that we're looking at the work, right? To make sure that, you know, every student, you know, is participating in a high impact practice and, and things like that. But I don't want, you know, I want to alleviate people's anxiety, <laughs> right? And, and also recognize it, that it is real. I get that. Oh, that's right. That's right. I guess the first job is to acknowledge what you feel, get an understanding of where it's coming from. To say, okay, it's okay. I can manage that. Yeah. Oh, Chris, it's very good to get to know you better. Great to see your face. I look, I look for the day when I'll see it in person. Yes. I see your voice in person. Look for the day when we're all on campus together again, and it will be a joyful day. I can imagine the tears and the laughter and the 
karma smiles and that helps us get through. So that's the goodbye from me. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you Stephen DeDio for making this happen. Thank you Chris for making it happen, volunteering. But I, the right thing to do is give you the last word, Chris. I think have a fabulously amazing semester, right? Enjoy the first day of class, right? And, it, and it's hard to put everything else out of our mind, but really being present in the moment with your students and, and, you know, and helping them get through the semester also. But I am thrilled to be here. I, I feel a part of the family already, if I could say that after a week and three days. But, you know, one of the students I met with said how she went from campus to campus trying to figure out the right school. And all she did was step on the campus at QCC and she knew this was the right school. And I had to say, I really understood that because I have felt that from everybody also that have told, you know, completely embraced me and made me feel welcome and as part of the family. And I appreciate that. And I thank everybody. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you very, very much, Chris. I'll see you soon, and everybody else. I'll see you soon.